Here's an interesting question. Can cinematography save a last and good film? Well, probably not, but at least it can make it less grating and much easier to digest. There's a proverb in Portuguese that goes like this. The eyes also eat, meaning that the way something looks also plays a part in its general appreciation. And in cinema, a visual medium par excellence, the way a film looks undeniably carries considerable weight for most people. Enter Saltburn, a 2023 perverted black comedy film directed by Emerald Fennell and starring an ensemble cast with many instantly recognizable faces, playing staunch reprobates with much debasement and extravagance in a grandiose country house and estate. Its reception has been sort of mixed, with glowing praise on social media being counterbalanced by less enthusiastic opinions on press. This video is not a review of the film, something which has been produced by several other channels, some of them with very perceptive and legitimate criticism, but more of an appreciation for one of its most conspicuous components, namely its lavish, vibrant, colorful visuals, which have drawn comparisons to works by Francis Ford Coppola or Stanley Kubrick, the cinematography department being handled by the talented Linus Sandgren, of La La Land, No Time to Die and Don't Look Up fame, amongst others. While some people have pointed out how the film at times appears to have been made with Instagram, Facebook or Tumblr feeds in mind, I believe such assumption to be a disservice to the hard work and efforts from the cinematographer, production designer, gaffer and art department crew who concurrently display much flair and resourcefulness. In this video I therefore pick 10 shots that I found particularly cool, ingenious or impressive from an aesthetic standpoint and reveal why they captivated me. So let's get down to the first one. This shot comes up early in the film, during the protagonist's opening monologue, for a mere two seconds, foreshadowing a scene that takes place later, lasting a bit longer than. It's a dark and somewhat enigmatic picture, one in which the silhouette of a human figure whose features remain concealed by the nightly gloom, appears standing between the spectator and blooming garden dyed with chilly hues. There's complete darkness on the top and bottom third of the frame, whilst in between, the faintly lit petals and leaves of the boughs and flowers sparkle, dotting the garden in a way that resembles a nebula or galaxy brimming with stars and assorted cosmic objects. The cinematography in Saltburn follows the rule of thirds faithfully, dividing the shots in definite horizontal and vertical layers, so there will be a recurring use of a grid to illustrate that. It also often resorts to frontal, top and side views, and many of its most alluring shots are framed in such a fashion, as one will see in the upcoming selection. There are a handful of features on this still frame that organically congregate in order to make the picture distinctive from other more conventional shots. The unusual top-down perspective, which occurs on other instances in the film, here allows the spectator to instantly perceive the frugal mise-en-scene, a nondescript, Russet-colored carpet acts as the plain and tepid chromatic bedrock of the scene, in which one of the characters lies, in a poster that could have been taken from a Michelangelo fresco, whilst the adumbrating shade of his friend looms over on his right side, with inverted orientation that grants it a symmetrical balance. The whole tableau is completed with mundane objects such as the pack of cigarettes, an ashtray and assorted clothing orbiting around them. The rectangular patches of sunlight on the floor define the two subjects in contrasting fashion, rescuing one from the shadows and revealing the other by casting his darkened figure on the ground. It's a deceptively elementary visual conception of an assuming but undeniable creativity that reflects the unorthodox spirit of the film applied to its visual framework, something which becomes more evident with the overlap of the grid based on the rule of thirds, demonstrating the clear-cut divisions and subject alignments in the shot. The backlit, semi-naked protagonist slowly approaches the viewer from a distance, the focal point standing in the center of the frame that has been precisely divided into two equal horizontal planes. This perspective effectively emulates that of the group of characters already awaiting him by the withered meadow, further dyed in yellow tint by the warm sun, and is a successful one in presenting a clear sense of depth, as one may discern the desiccated herbage in the foreground, the subject, and tall, green trees in the middle ground, complemented by the continuation of the grassland, a row of trees and a building in the background. For some reason, this picture brings to mind the paintings of Andrew Wyeth, specifically Turkey Pond, in which a man is also found walking away from the viewer in a yellowish pasture. In Saltburn, ignoring for a moment the supercilious and gothic setting, and the depraved nature of its characters, such a bucolic scene taking place in British land could easily incur in the recollection of verses by John Keats or John Clare.
an apparently trivial scene is made rather uncanny after being turned upside down. Yet, there is more than meets the eye at first sight in here than just an axis twist. Ollie is smoking a cigarette by the pond while lying in the grass. Although his body is off-center, escaping through the top left corner, the pristine mirroring of the garden gate and its walls in the water project a symmetry within the shot that is quite compelling aesthetically, not to mention that many elements in the canvas appear judiciously allocated to spatial blocks. An additional reading reveals a value contrast between the subdued lighting of a cloudy day that blends with the narrow and chilly color palette established by the grass, water lilies, lichens, moss and trees, and all his bright and rest pale torso, a scene that would perhaps appeal to pre-Raphaelite artists in its pastoral tone and casual nakedness. Other similar iterations of this shot can be found in the film, this time featuring actress Alice and Oliver, in a scene referring to a shot inspected further down the road. There's a seductive harmony and beautiful sense of serenity emanating from this snapshot. This is due mostly to the elegantly framed scene in which the environmental features, whether natural or man-made, emerge and populate the canvas with what one could describe as almost painterly sensibility. Even though the locus of this piece takes root right in the center, there's a remarkable balance in the composition of the setting, as it manages to avoid being overcrowded and too sparse. The staffage in this landscape appears laid and woven through a fine brush in expert hands, with the dim presence of the moon acting as the cherry on top. In addition to that, the timing for the shoot has been selected conscientiously, as the delicate golden light of the afternoon, whose curtains are already drawing by then, provides a much delectable silky veil over the entire scenery, and the dim, warm, purplish and orange tint in the sky has been propitiously matched by the outdoor furniture and props at the main stage of the action to provide a coherent chromatic framework. Now here's a kind of shot that takes us back some decades in cinema. The low-key lighting, with crisp chiaroscuro and backlit silhouettes, is a staple of film noir cinematography, although the somewhat ominous atmosphere in this scene is more fitting of a classic horror flick, perhaps. From the outside, it seems like an evil villain, shrouded by darkness, is calmly stepping down a stairway, whilst flanked by two large balustrade finials, to meet his prisoner, a damsel in distress, one would assume. Although the actual dynamic of the scene in the film is radically different, the visuals are nonetheless highly enthralling, since there's a predominance of impenetrable shadows, seizing practically two-thirds of the space within the frame with its indeterminacy, an opaque area disturbed only by a human figure rendered in high contrast lighting with luminous outlines, looking as if suspended midair. The only discernible color is a mild, dark blue tone that tactfully reinforces the eerie aura of a soon-to-become rather startling episode here portrayed in a simple but effective composition. Another top-down perspective and a highly stylized shot at that too. One can easily tell that Linus Sandgren must have had a blast with the visual design during the shoot, as this is a kind of shot that comes with an undeniable sense of fun and inventiveness. Venetia, played by Alice and Oliver, has been centered in the shot and confined mostly to the bottom third of the frame whereas a watermelon pool float lingers in the top third. From a geometric standpoint, it's quite a lively picture, as the straight lines from the wooden boards and beach towel confront the circular green, yellow and red patterns of the inflatable, and both clash with the rhizomatic water lilies that, at first sight, resemble a geometric pattern. By now, it should be apparent that Saltburn strives to employ a restrained color scheme in its individual shots, for although vibrant and saturated hues may manifest, they are usually tamed and matched in circumscribed arrangements between them, and this is a perfect example of that, with green and red attaining the main role within this picture. As an extra, another shot in this same setting also deserves an honorable mention, a landscape view perhaps more akin to a house portrait, which to some may recall the sites explored by British painters who delved into the country house painting craze and which had great success between the 17th and 19th century, a style that ended up becoming a genre by itself. I know, I know, another dark, low-key shot with silhouettes, but I can't help myself. For all those generic and perfectly lit faces and spaces seen on most other films, there must be a counterbalance, and here in Saltburn there are a few differing iterations worth gazing at. As per other shots in the film, the space and action are elaborated through a side view that confers to the picture an almost two-dimensional character. 
further enhanced by the 4x3 screen ratio and especially considering the lack of depth in this specific instance. Within Saltburn, this is a crucial scene that will dictate the events on the last quarter of the film, but judging the picture just by itself, it's fairly easy to tell why it may capture one's attention. The mood is once again quite somber and eerie, pretty much due to the single main light source illuminating the subjects, the maze walls and the imposing minotaur sculpture, all of them enveloped in a hazy cloak of fog. It's hard to discern texture, varying color and other features, but it's a picture that mesmerizes through its highly atmospheric, focused and willful design. This picture wears all the hallmarks of romanticism up front, and could there be anything wrong with that, ever? Its gloomy lighting, broad spatial depth, muted coloring and misty setting work wonders in conveying the mournful tone of the scene, but in terms of framing, it's also a carefully composed image. With grass in the foreground assuming the role of repoussoir, there's a sense of peeping about it, almost as if the spectator is witnessing a secret meeting purposefully hidden from sight, with the tree and branches on the right bank taking up the empty space in the sky with their upper portion, and directing the eyes toward the middle ground where the rendezvous takes place. This bridge, centered and thereby dissecting the shot horizontally in two, and its subjects are reflected dimly on the water too, with a ghostly manifestation making the scene appear even more ethereal. Gazing at it, it's hard not to be reminded of the romantic painters of the 19th century such as Caspar David Friedrich or Johann Christian Dahl, whose emotionally stirring landscape views showcase the deep spiritual naturalism. Continuing the anguished tone from the previous shot, here is what is considered to be one of the most iconic scenes in the film, but the reason for that shall remain undisclosed to avoid spoiling it. Kneeling in front of a grave, Ollie appears despondent and forlorn, utterly squashed by a thick, greyish-blue, overcast sky that seems heavier than the entire earth. In a familiar fashion by now, the shot has been divided in horizontal blocks, the bottom third comprised of the shadowy ground and the serrated graveyard wall, whilst the visible treetop on the left takes the length of the middle third, leaving the uppermost section entirely defined by sky. Noticing as well how Ollie's sharply outlined figure against the skies marks the length of the bottom half of the shot. As a mere curiosity, from the tree top one can trace a descending line touching Ollie's parietal bone and reaching the tip of the memorial cross, just another fortunate detail that discreetly supports an imaginative geometrical reading of the image, making it a more appealing and unique shot as compared to other more trivial images. So there you go, those are the 10 of the most stimulating shots in Saltburn. Which one was your favorite? What other shots in the film have captured your attention? Share it with everyone in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this selection, feel free to check my other content, perhaps you'll enjoy the 10 shots I picked also from Andres Vyangitsev's The Return, and if you feel like it, pay a visit to my recently opened Patreon. I'm posting some exclusive content there, book hauls, book reviews, film reviews and more, which you can access for a small fee that helps me continue the work on the channel and plan for future uploads. To Abner Valenzuela and Batastus, I express my deepest appreciation. As patrons, your support is sincerely appreciated, it encourages me and helps me in producing better content for the channel. As always, I thank you all for listening and I'll catch you in the next video.